angels declare you are worthy You spoke the word and created the earth Stars erupt in praise Stars erupt in praise We stand in no
Good morning, I'm Lenise. And I'm CJ. And welcome to Every, Every Nation, Nation Church, Church New City. Jersey. We're getting ready to watch Every Nation online. But we want to remind you, even though we're unable to gather physically at this time, we have several ways to stay connected. We have virtual connect groups, weekly prayer calls, and other ways to stay connected. For more details, check out our website and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to, to stay updated. So now, we're getting ready to prepare our hearts. Let's get ready for church! It's your breath in our lives. 
Hey, good morning, every nation, New Jersey. God bless you. PA here, Pastor Adam Bird. So excited about sharing uh, uh, this Sunday morning with you. If you're new to us, you've caught us uh, right at the beginning of a new series on the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at, at chapter 3. And, and just a, a little side note before we get into our text. Did you know that in the book of Matthew, between chapters 2 and 3, it represents 25 years uh, 25 to 30 years of time, like that one page, that one blip in between chapters, 25 years have passed. And so I just couldn't help but just uh, by starting this morning, by just reminding us, you know, that the scriptures say this, that our life, it's but a vapor. It's here today and gone today. And so it's, it's when I get to texts like this that it it actually it causes me to pause and, and remind myself that, that every moment we have is a gift from God to, to enjoy uh, each and every moment uh, as a gift from God. And you know, it's funny that the older I get, the days are longer, but the years are shorter. Uh, any of my elder generation can amen me on that one. And so enjoy where you are. And you know this, some of you might be like, hey, pastor, I'm in a real junky season right now. But I promise you, if if you take the effort to look, you know that every season, every season in our life has both good things and bad things. It's what we're looking for um, that makes all the difference. And so um, I think you would agree with me that that a hummingbird, it, it seeks after sweet nectar. And a vulture, it seeks after dead things. And get this, both of them find exactly what they're looking for. And so I pray that you're, uh, that, that we are a people that are looking to find the thread of good, uh, in each and every day and moment that God gives us. But that's not my message. So I hope you got your coffee, you got your Bible, and you're ready to go in, in Matthew chapter three. And so before we do, we need to frame out where we're going with a story. And so, um, uh, I want to share a story. I'll, I'll begin with my, my, el- my eldest daughter, Cassie. And so, my oldest daughter, Cassie, um, she has, I believe it's a spiritual gift because this girl, every morning when she's racing out to work, um, she's got seven water bottles, uh, an iced coffee, her, her purse, handbook, keys, and I'm like, how in the good Lord's name is she hanging on to all this stuff, doesn't spill anything, is able to get in her car and whisk off and drive away, but... Um, her continually doing this was going to be problematic because uh, she came home the other day and, and she was just beside herself because she had this um, uh, petite necklace that she had saved up for and she had bought and she just loved this ne- necklace. It had a deep sentimental value to her. And, and she took it off and, and apparently she doesn't know where, but she probably was like fumbling with some stuff and she lost the necklace. So she came home really distraught and I was like, baby girl, uh, God is going to get your necklace back to you. I'm, I just, I believe God is going to give it back to you. And my wife, she echoed the same sentiment of faith that God was going to come through for her. And so, uh, and then when my daughter left, she doesn't know this, but I'm like, please God come through. (laughs) So I want to encourage my daughter's heart. And, and so, uh, she went that same day and, um, uh, drove to her work and looked to the parking lot to she, see if she could find it. She was coming home. I was sure she was going to say, I found it dad in Jesus name. And she came home, nothing. She goes to work the second day. Uh, and then I'm sure someone is going to have turned it into the lost and found or something. And she goes to work, comes back. She still did not find what she was looking for. Wah, wah, wah. I was like, come on, Jesus. But, um, but, but here's the thing I, I want us to, to look at this morning is this, is I am confident of this as I read the scriptures, um, that Jesus is concerned about lost things. In fact, Jesus is going to take uh, an entire chapter in Luke chapter 15, um, and he's going to tell three stories, three parables. It's a trilogy, and each of them are about uh, finding lost things, lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And, and the, the thing uh, that's, that's, um, uh, that resonates in, in each story is this, is that when they're found, heaven 
and earth rejoice over the lost peace that was found. And so that's going to lead us to our text today in Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at verses uh, 1 through 10, and I'll probably read a little bit and, and teach a little bit, read a little bit, teach a little bit, all right? I hope that's okay this morning. Uh, so that's where we're headed. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it reads like this. It says, in those days, John the Baptist, so John the Baptist is the second cousin of Jesus. Uh, he's about five months older than him. So it says, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And here was his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time on that statement. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But but I want to highlight this is that notice that that John was preaching in the wilderness. And we just got to take a moment to highlight the, this reality that God tends to meet with his people in the wilderness. This section, the wilderness of Judea, um, it was just a few miles west of the Dead Sea. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the Dead Sea, it's the lowest place on planet Earth. It's, a, it's about, um, let me see, I, I wrote it down here, about 1,380 feet below sea level. And, and so we see this, that, that it's amazing that in the lowest places of our life, isn't it strange that those seem, seem to be the times when God is most near and connects with his people? Uh, for example, my, my mother, um, my parents divorced when I was about 11 years old, and, and my father received custody of us, um, which was kind of different in that day. It just didn't really happen like that. Uh, my mother was, was just searching and broken, and, and she was agnostic at the time, but she was drawn to a church in her wilderness season, in the low part of her life. She met Jesus. She heard the gospel, met Jesus, and became a Christian. And, and I'm sitting here today because of that. All right. And so Jesus, he, he can, he can meet us in the low places. Notice this verse three. He goes on and says this, for this is he who has spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord make his path straight. And so um, what, what he, the, the prophet Isaiah is actually prophesying to God's people that are uh, in uh, Babylonian capti captivity. They're currently under the Persian king Cyrus, and Isaiah is prophesying that, that one day you, you need, that, that God's going to let you return home again, and he's going to make a way through the wilderness, and he's going to take you home. And it's amazing how that prophecy in Isaiah that was good for the people of God in captivity as well would preach to us that, that we need to that make a way in the wilderness. Why? Because the great delivering King, Jesus, has come to take us home. And so um, notice this. Uh, it, it goes on and says this. Now John, so John the Baptist, wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. So if we're honest, it sounds like John the Baptist was a little bit of a freak show, right? <laughs> Wearing camel's hair and a leather belt. And did, like, did it catch your eye? That, like, why is it telling us uh, John's attire? Uh, later on, check this out, that in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, we read the prophet Elijah, the Tishbite, that Elijah was a man who wore camel's hair and a leather belt. What we see is John the Baptist was dressed like Elijah the prophet. Here's why that's important. The last book of Malachi in your Old Testament. Remember that Matthew uh, connects uh, the Old Testament to the New Testament. And in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, it says this, that before the Messiah comes, before the great king comes, that the prophet Elijah is going to come. And John the Baptist is playing uh, that that Old Testament prophet, Elijah, uh, in this scene. And, uh, and then notice this in verse 5. It says, Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And we're going to talk about the baptism of Jesus next week. But for this week, I just want you to get an image of this, that people are coming from Judea, Jerusalem, from all around the area, that something had gripped their hearts, something new, um, and, and that they, they were wanting to draw near afresh to God. And so they, they gathered to, to J John at the uh, Jordan River, and it was there. 
It says that they confessed their sins, that, that they were standing before this mob of people and, and they, they said with, with tears and, uh, and, and with moaning and, and, and sorrow, they said, I did this and I've done this and I've done this. And they confessed their sin and they said, God, forgive me. I repent. And John would baptize them in the Jordan River. An unbelievably powerful scene. But now we're going to look at another group of people. Verse 7, it says, But when, when he saw uh, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, we'll talk about them today, coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Can we agree John sounds a little aggressive? Uh, verse 9, he says, And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you just give us great grace today as we, we uh, open up your word. We thank you. We love you. Let us hear what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, uh, amen. And so, um, so listen, uh, I, I want to camp out this morning on that phrase, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so uh, I, I'm sure uh, all of us have seen the Turner Burn guy, right? You know that Turner Burn guy, the guy in Times Square was wearing the sign, repent, Turner Burn. And, and listen, I think we would all agree that it's, it's, that message is kind of off-putting both to Christians and non-Christians alike. I know I was down in Times Square, this guy's like, turn or burn. And I'm like, bro, you're not helping us out here, man. But um, so I feel like I got to do a little work this morning to redeem that word, repent, repent. And so it really is a beautiful, beautiful word. And it's a gift from God. And so when you hear the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, Here's what you need to remember is this. It's a mega theme throughout your Bible. In fact, in the gospel of Matthew, more than more so than any other gospel, it talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. They're interchangeable. And in, in fact, he talks about it so much, the kingdom of God, that it's uh, for it's on um it, it appears 1.5 times per page of your Bible. And so it's this mega theme of the kingdom of God. And, and what you need to think of when you think of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, think of this. Oh, it's where Jesus rules and reigns. It's where sin, death, and sorrow no longer exist. Um, when you think of the kingdom of God, here's what I want you to think of. Think of this. Think of home. The kingdom of God is the home design for you and for me. If I can take you all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 1, it's in the beginning God creates the heavens and the earth. Boom! He speaks light be and suddenly God begins to create this beautiful oasis, a home for God's people, God's image bearers. That in Genesis chapter 2, God creates a woman from the man. He puts the man and the wooden woman in the Garden of Eden, and the Bible is clear about this. It says, it says they were naked and they felt no shame. Like, like I, I'm sure the, uh, the, the naked physical part was pretty amazing, uh, if that's okay to say on a Sunday morning. But I also would say this. There's something very profound um, that, that men and women, and, and men and men, that, that we, can, we can be um, naked as far as being transparent, being open, about our, 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 our fears, our concerns. Like we can take the facade, the fakeness down and just to be at rest and at ease with who we are in the presence of other people. It's a beautiful place. And that place, that place is home. I mean, think about it. Like when you travel or you're at other people's houses or, or you travel to a hotel, aren't you always just a little bit on edge? You never quite sleep as well as you do at home. You never, like I got this place, like my bed at home. It's kind of like, it's kind of like sunken in to me and I can just, it's like I'm getting in the womb, man. And, <laughs> and so, and so I sleep well in my home. I'm at rest in my home. I have my seat 
at my home with the clickers nearby. And so, man, I hope you have your seat, right? And then all these different things. Do you know that, that in my home, I don't feel like I need to, uh, I need to appear a certain way. In fact, there's been moments I've left my home and like, man, I haven't looked in the mirror all day. I hope I don't have stuff in my teeth and my, my hair is not all messed up, that type of thing. And so, so home is a place where you can be at rest. You can be authentically you in who you are. And so um, I love this. The great Charles Dickens, um, he said this. He says, home, it's a simple word, only four letters, but, but it's a word that carries weight. Dickens would go on to say this, that home is a stronger word than any magician or conjurer has ever spoke before. And so, so listen, it, home is, is the most powerful four letter word you've ever wanted spoke over your life. And so Hollywood and Disney, do you, do you know this? They've captured, um, the reality that home, it, it's intoxicating to you. You're drawn to this idea of home. They've made billions of dollars because of it. Like you remember the, we were introduced to home with the Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And, and later on, we would find out that E.T. would need to phone home. Like he, he had this longing to get back to his homeland, right? That, that we have, I can get you more up to speed if you'd like. Finding Nemo, like every Pixar movie you can think of, what is it about? It's about the high, heart's desire to find home from Toy Story to Finding Nemo. It's the story of finding home. Listen, I, I watch those kid movies sometimes and I get embarrassed that, that it actually touches something deep in my heart. What? It's that longing for home. Um, uh, listen, maybe uh, cartoons and that's not your thing. Maybe you're the HGTV person. I'm talking to you, Susan Burt. <laughs> so we know that HGTV, they have who? Fixer Upper, uh, Chip and JoJo uh, Gaines. And, and listen, the, the show is about the design of homes. Uh, but what you're buying, you're buying what? Family or the sense of home. Like you see their little kids and the way their family interacts and they just, they just go and, and what? There's something in your heart. That's what you're buying. You're not buying a house. You're buying a home that, um, I don't know if you remember the phenomenon, uh, duck dynasty. Do we remember this? A bunch of, uh, long haired, long beard, redneck people. And, and, and we just couldn't get enough duck dynasty. And what was it? It was like 30 minutes of just ridiculous stuff, but this, but the, the show would end every week with the family gathered around the table and they would pray, they would break bread together and enjoy one another. And, and we were captivated, captivated by the sense of home. Colossians 1 verse 16 says this, that you've been created by God and for God, that, that you've been created for a home, a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. And, and inside, we long for it. We long for it. Unfortunately, if you get to Genesis 3, you realize this, that we lost home, that, that we lost Eden, that, that we believed the lie that somehow uh, life would be better with God out of the picture. And so, listen, sin is always going to promise you life, but never able to deliver on it. It's going to promise you uh, um, wholeness and fullness, and yet it's never, ever going to deliver. It's always going to be just out here, just out of your reach. In fact, I saw this video today and I thought this is such a picture of what sin promises us. Uh, why don't you check this out? So is that, was that hysterical? I mean, but the, isn't that it? Like sin promises, oh, if I could just get this thing and you, you wind up chasing it all the day of your life and, and yet you find yourself empty, lacking, and wanting. Uh, I, I, still, I heard a, about an article in Cosmopolitan magazine. No, I did not read that magazine, but in Cosmo, it had this, this uh, gripping headline. It said this, um, the future of sex. 
And so you're wondering, what's Cosmos saying about what's next? And it was going to give the two biggest trends of, of, of about concerning sex in this post-pandemic world. And you're ready for what they are? Let me give you the two big ones. Number one is this, that there's going to be less hookups. <laughs> that Cosmo is just saying this, that, that this whole hookup culture, it's found people empty, lacking, and wanting um, the second thing that, that they're going to find, this is going to be the post-pandemic way of sex, is that people uh, are going to desire to be in a committed relationship. In fact, they christened the next generation, they're going to be the commitment generation. Hmm. <laughs> These ideas sound awfully familiar to me. See, see, we can run and chase after the lies that sin offers us, but eventually we always want to come where? Back home to the ways of Almighty God. And so, so th there's the kingdom of God. It, it is the promise of home, the return of home to us. And repent, repent is uh, in the Greek, it's the word metanoia. It means to change your mind, uh, or, or to change your actions or your direction. And so, um, it was funny. <laughs> Some maybe you've heard it this way. You turn from sin and you turn back to God. That is repenting. It was funny. One time I, this, this guy, he says, Pastor, he says, I've made a 360 degree turn in my life. And I'm like, bro, that just means you're right back where you started again. I think you mean 180, 180 degree. Yeah, 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 pastor. That's what I mean. And so, so we want to make a 180 degree turn. We uh, see the, the, the appeal, the, the cry to repent. What it is, it's an invitation, an appeal to come home once again. I love in Romans chapter two, it says this, that it's the kindness of God, the kindness of God that leads us into repentance. I wanted to share this story, and I, forgive me if it's too long. In fact, we're going to do an every nation first. I'm going to break out the uh, the readers. Yes, I I need the uh, the new body. The I'm waiting for the resurrected body to get me some new eyes. But I want to read this story that uh, that I came across here and. If I could, it's about a girl that grew up in the Michigan area. It says this, There was a young girl who grew up on Cherry Orchard just outside of Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents, who are a bit old-fashioned, tended to overact to her nose rings, music, and short skirts. They grounded her a few times, and then one night her father knocked on her door after an argument to try to reach out to her. She screamed, I hate you. Later that night, she ran away. She headed for Detroit, a place she had been only once before on a bus trip with her church youth group to watch the Tigers play. Since the papers were filled uh, with the lurid details about the gangs and the drugs and the violence in downtown Detroit, she thought that, that would be the last place her parents would look for her. On her second day in the city, she met a man who drove the biggest car she had ever seen. He offered her a ride, bought her lunch, and arranged for her to have a place to stay. Uh, he was just so nice. He even gave her some pills to make her feel better than she'd ever felt before. She thought that she had been uh, right all along. Her parents had been keeping her from all the fun and from the good life. And that good life went along for a month, two months, a year. And the man with the big car taught her a few things that men like. And since she was underage, men paid a premium for her. Every now and then, she thought about her parents back home, but their lives now seemed so boring and plain and so old-fashioned that she could hardly believe she grew up there. She had a brief scare when she saw a picture on a billboard with the headline, Have You Seen This Child? But now, she had blonde hair, and with all the makeup and jewelry she wore, nobody would mis mistake her for a child. And after a year, the first signs of the illness began to appear. It amazed her how fast her boss turned mean, he told her that he couldn't risk having anyone around who was sick like that, and he threw her out on the street without a penny to her name. She found that she was able to turn a couple of tricks a night, but they didn't pay much, and all the money went to support her drug habit. When winter came, she found herself sleeping on, a metal, on metal gates outside the large downtown deport, department stores. And sleeping uh, is the wrong word, though. A teenage girl at night in downtown Detroit can never relax her guard. And soon, dark bands circled her eyes, and her cough worsened. And one night, as she lay awake, listening for footsteps that might harm her, everything about her life suddenly looked different. She felt for the first time in a year, like the little girl that she was, lost in a cold and frightening city. She began to cry. Her pockets were empty, 
and she was hungry. She needed a fix. She pulled her legs underneath her and shivered under the newspaper. She piled up on top of her coat, trying to stay warm. And suddenly, a memory came into her mind of May and springtime in her hometown, with a million cherry trees in bloom and her golden retriever chasing a tennis ball. And she said to herself, Oh God, why did I leave? And she started to cry again and knew that more than anything else in the world, she wanted to go home. She tried to call her parents three straight calls, three straight connections to voicemail. But on the third one, she finally left a message. Dad, Mom, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way, and it'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, I get it. I guess I'll just stay on the bus. It took about seven hours for a bus to make all the stops between Detroit and her home. And during that time, she, she could think about, all she could think about were the flaws in her plan. What if they were out of town and they didn't get the message? What if they were home, but she didn't give them enough time to get, to be at the bus station? What if they didn't even want her back? And then she began to rehearse what she would say. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It was not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She said the words over and over, practicing. And when the bus finally rolled into the station, the driver said, Traverse City, Michigan, 15 minutes stop. 15 minutes for her entire life to be decided. She checked herself in a compact mirror, smoothed her hair, licked the lipstick off her teeth. She looked at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wondered if her parents would notice. She got off the bus and walked into the terminal, not knowing what to expect. But not one of a thousand scenes that entered her mind matched what she saw because there, within those concrete walls and plastic chairs in the bus terminal, stood a group of 40 brothers and sisters and great aunts and uncles and cousins and grandmothers and even a great grandmother. And they were all wearing goofy party hats and blowing noisemakers. Taped across the entire wall of the terminal was a banner that read, Welcome Home. And then out of the crowd stepped her dad. And through tears, she started to say, Dad, I'm sorry. I know. And he stopped her. Hush, child. We've got no time for that. You'll be late for the party. A banquet is waiting for you. Where? At home. At home. And so, um, obviously, I hope you could, you, you caught it that that was a, an, actually a retelling of the story found in Luke 15 of the prodigal son. And, and so, um, uh, it's interesting. Maybe you've heard of the great prophet, Mike Tyson. Uh, Mike Tyson said this, uh, if you're not humble in this world, then the world will throw humbleness upon you. If you're not humble in this world, that the world, it'll throw humbleness upon you. And if you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son who, who, uh, squanders all his father's money, and he wakes up in a really, really dark place, in, in a pig's pen, in the muck, in the mire. And isn't it amazing, in the low places of our life, that things become crystal clear. That it was in that moment, from the perspective of being in the lowest place of his life, that he's able to see so clearly, it's better in my father's house. It's better where? At home. And God is calling you home. Um, so I, I want to look at the two, the two groups of people that John the Baptist comes hard at, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember, he yells at them, you brood of vipers. And I would submit to you that John is coming hard at the Pharisees and Sadducees because they had hard hearts. They had self-righteous, religious, hard hearts. And John desperately wanted them to repent, to come home again. And so he came hard to break up the hard soil of their hearts. So um, the, the word Pharisee, it, it means separate one, separate ones. And so what they, they were a group of religious knickknacks that what they wanted to do is they said, we're going to do over and above what the law asks for us. And so they began, to, they added all these traditions and other laws. And what's astounding to me is like, you couldn't keep the 10. Why are you going to add a whole bunch of other ones to your life and to the life of others? Um, they had ridiculous laws where um, that, that determined, hey, you could spit uh, uh, on the ground, but you could spit on a rock because it, with, with the dirt, you could make mud. And that's like making a, a mortar. 
And so uh, it, it's, it's, it was just insane. And so here's what the Pharisees would do. They would heap laws upon other people, laws they couldn't keep themselves. And so they would go around and they found themselves, they became the morality per- police. They were aware of what's wrong with everyone else in the world, and they were blind to what's wrong in their own life. And so uh, if I was going to shoot you straight this morning, uh, I can have a little Pharisee in me at times. Like a um, uh, little uh, sidetrack story. So I was a, a part of a ministry called HMI. It stands for Hockey Ministries International. And um, during the off season in the summertime, they would hold these summer camps uh, for young kids. And we would teach them hockey. And then in the evening, we'd do Bible studies and we'd share our testimony. And these kids would just get get saved, uh, you know, in droves. And so I remember one particular time we had a, a hockey player. His name was Gord Donnelly, great guy, very raw in the faith, if you know what I mean. And at this this time, Gord Donnelly and myself, we were the professional hockey players just playing against some scrub counselors. But these counselors were pretty good. And he and I were having a try now. And, and I could see Gord Donnelly beginning to get frustrated uh, on the ice as these kids kept stealing the puck from him. <laughs> and so I could see the boiling point until finally at one time, uh, this little kid stole the puck from him and he stopped, turned around, and he just screamed, fudge! But he didn't say fudge, okay? And, and the, the, there's the stands are filled with these little like 10, 11, 12-year-old kids. And he screams out that. And so, so you know what he did? He repented <laughs> right after that because he immediately turned around and he said, I'm sorry, forgive me, right? And so, um, but that's not where I'm going because in the uh, HMI camp, you know, we'd stay in these, these little small dormitories. And so I was rooming with a great guy, a pastor, an, an older pastor. Uh, his name is Ken Weldon, fantastic guy. But when we're in these little small dorm rooms in the heat of summer, suddenly I'm like, man, something stinks in here. And I think it's Ken's feet. I'm like, man, this corn chip smell would stank and fill the room. And I'm asking Jesus to kill me, okay? And I'm like, I don't know if I can handle an entire week with this. Until Ken had left the room, and I noticed that the stench was still in there. Uh, and come to find out, that stench was not Ken Weldon, but it was my flip-flops. <laughs> Who knew flip-flops could stink like that, okay? And so the problem wasn't Ken. The problem was me. Um, I, I love uh, what, what G.K. Chesterton said, that uh, when the London Times asked him to, to write an essay on what's wrong with the world, he wrote two letters. What's wrong with the world? I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. And so, see, I can have some Pharisee in me, so quick to find out what's wrong in other people and blind to what's wrong in my own life. And so here's what I'm just so glad is there's no people out here today that, that are self-righteous, um, that are, that are judging and damning people, right? I'm so glad that that no longer exists. It was just back in Jesus's time. Like there's no one on social media, like, like judging people, um, uh, ripping them a new one. I'm glad we just never do that anymore. Are you kidding me? Like, like I see people, Christians, like doing stuff, judging people, uh, uh, cancel culture, canceling people. And you know what that is? That's brood of viper stuff. Like, like we don't do that stuff as Christians. What we do as Christ followers, we don't lean against the cross and say, you, you need to repent. You need to repent. That, that as Jesus followers, we don't lean against the cross. We kneel in front of it. And we invite people to come. Hey, there's room for you. There's room for you. There's room for you. And so um, if you have some Pharisee in you, here's what I know, is I know it's relationships are hard for you because you're judgmental on people and you're lonely. Um, I know this, if there's Pharisee in you, that, that you're exhausted because you're having to put on this facade of being something that you're really not. And so you're having to pretend that you're better than you are. And did you know this, that, that psychology has, has uh, said this, that um, there's something called the imposter syndrome. It, it's, it's when the, it's this low-grade fear of being found a fake and a fraud, like that you're afraid that people see that you're not as holy as you portray yourself to be, that, that you're not as smart as people think you are. You're not as funny as people think you are. There's this low-grade fear, and you're exhausted from having to do this. And I got one um, suggestion for you this morning. 
repent. Hey, hey, repent of self-righteous pride and come home. Man, come home. Listen, the cross has already outed you. Man, you are a sinner like the rest of us in need of grace. Repent and come home. Um, there's also these other ones, uh, the Sadducees. And the, the term Sadducee, it means correct ones. Like, you can't write this stuff up. So we have um, the separate ones and the correct ones. And so uh, this is so perfect for 2021 in this time where we're so quick to get into our tribes and our little groups. And, and what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to term they're villains and we're the good ones. And so they were called the Sadducees, the correct ones. Here's something else that's interesting, that the Sadducees, that they were way more political than they were spiritual. Hmm. I'm just glad we're not like that today. I, I'm glad that our political ideology uh, doesn't uh, circumvent our biblical theology, right? I'm so glad we don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, Lord, help us from the, the, the heart of a Sadducee. And so like uh, some other little side notes that will play into the behavior of a Sadducee. Do you know this, that they only believed in the first five books of your Old Testament, the Pentateuch. Uh, they didn't believe in angels. Um, that as well, they, they didn't believe in a resurrection, which is unbelievably important. See, so for a Sadducee with no resurrection, this is all there is. And I, I need to get mine now, get it while I can. And so people became a commodity. Um, and, and so what they were unable to be generous. Why? Because this is all there is. And then they couldn't enjoy what they had. Why? Because they're afraid of losing what they have. And so the, the live the life of a Sadducee is exhausting and empty and lonely. And listen, at times I've had some Sadducee in my life. Have you? Like, um, have you ever uh, attempted to use God before? Like, um, I I've shared this story before, but I think it's appropriate. As, uh, um, I remember I was trying out for a Team USA. Uh, we, we gathered with a, a you know, group of about 80 uh, hockey players in Colorado Springs and was trying to make Team USA. And I remember, man, I was on my best behavior. I'm reading my Bible. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to swear. I'm praying, doing all these things. But I'm like, God, just let me make the team. Just let me make the team. And sure enough, I made the team and I went out and did what every good Christian would do after that. I went out and got hammered with my teammates. And so, so as we're jumping from bar to bar, um, in the streets of Colorado Springs at about 2 a.m. in the morning, there's a man on a street corner and he's the Turner Burn guy. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And God used that man like a sledgehammer to absolutely pound my heart. And as I heard those words, I heard the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit drew a line in the sand for me that day. And he says this. I heard the Lord speak this to me. He says, do you want me or do you just want to use me for stuff? And that was a game changer for me in my life. And I'm so glad that the Lord called me to repentance. He called me home, back to fellowship with himself. And so um, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you're going to see throughout the Gospels that there's these, they're the continual adversaries of Jesus Christ. They would be the ones who eventually would uh, hang them, have him hung on a cross. And see, they saw Jesus as a threat, trying to take from them but they didn't rec recognize the reality that he was actually a savior come to rescue them and to bring them back home. But they refused and they hung him on a cross. And so, um, uh, my, my, my wife and I, we've been watching, uh, uh, the British baking challenge. I know, listen, we're, I know we're nerds and my wife is, she was watching the crown. I don't know if you guys have seen this show, but, but it's funny. I, I told my wife, I'm like, I'm starting to, to, to dream in, in English accents. And I don't know, a little known tidbit. But did you know my wife Susan and I that, that our family is, is right from over the pond? Like we are from England and I heard this great legend, um, uh, uh, this legend of, of uh, Gellert the dog. And so, uh, listen, this is for my dog lovers here. I can't believe I hadn't heard this one, but it, it's, it's a legend uh, of the great hound of Wales. And, um, you can actually, I think I have a picture that, that we have a, a monument of them. They've, they've made paintings of Gellert and in the legend, uh, it goes like this. 
is that that the great huntsman had his his fearless hound Gellert that would go hunting with him. And this one particular time that the huntsman's out out hunting, and and Gellert he he runs off, and so the huntsman he he finishes his hunt and he goes back home. And as he enters his castle, he sees he's greeted immediately by Gellert who's covered in blood. And as he meets him, that that suddenly he sees that that um, the the man's uh, son's cradle has been tipped over, it too is covered in blood. And immediately he believes that Gellert uh, has slaughtered his son. And the huntsman takes his sword and he drives it in to the, to the, the faithful dog's heart. And it, it screams out with a yelp. And suddenly with that scream, the huntsman hears the cry of a baby in another room. And there in that room was a, was a mutilated wolf that had tried to kill his son. See, that Gellert had saved his life. And it sounds eerily familiar to me of a story of, it's another legend, but this legend is true. It's the story of God coming to earth and becoming a man. He came to rescue his people and take them home again, but his people refused and they put him on a cross. They, they pierced his hands, his feet, and his side. And as he screamed out his last breath, it is finished. It was in that moment that, that Jesus was actually reconciling man back to his father. He was actually bringing us back home again. Uh, last story. So, uh, do you know God really does love lost things? He loves, uh, lost sheep, lost coins, lost sons. You know what else he loves? He loves this. He loves lost necklaces. This is uh, my, my daughter's necklace. Maybe you can get the rest of the story now is um, that, that my daughter returned to work on the third day. And on that third day, she in her lunch break, she went to Starbucks and she, she drove back to her salon where she works. And she was actually um, bemoaning the fact that she lost her prized necklace uh, to a friend that she went to Starbucks with. And as she opened the door, while she was still bemoaning her loss, she opened it up. And as she looked on the ground in the parking lot, there lie the necklace that she had lost, that God had returned her necklace to her because God loves to save lost things. And God wants to save your life. He wants to bring you home again. And so I just want to give this opportunity this morning that um, if maybe you feel lost Maybe you feel that, that like that prodigal son or prodigal daughter that you've been running away from your heavenly father and life has kicked the trash out of you. You know what? This is your moment. This is your call where God is calling you back home again. Let's pray. Father, I just uh, thank you for this time. and Lord, I thank you that you're a God who answers prayers, Lord. God, I thank you that you are the God who came to reconcile us and bring us home again. And Lord, I want to pray for the, this morning, God, for those that, that feel empty and lost. Lord, I pray this morning that you would save mightily. God, that you would f save uh, lost uh, sons and daughters and you would reconcile them back to themselves, back to yourself. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you, if you prayed that prayer this morning, or if, if you just, ch just put in a, a simple amen, man, it would just encourage my heart to hear what God's doing in your life. And, and listen, the, the sermon's over, but we're not done because I want to remind you that if you need prayer or counseling for anything, you can meet with a pastor on our virtual ministry Zoom call. Uh, the number will appear uh, at the, the, the end of this broadcast, and they'll be available at 11 a.m. this morning, Easter Standard Time, that you can uh, do it, get on a virtual call with a pastor. And then lastly, I want to remind you of this, that, that if, if our service has been a blessing to you, uh, would you consider financially sowing into it? Or, or if you're already a member of Every Nation New Jersey, you know this, that we believe in the tithe, that, that a 10% of everything that we gain, uh, we, we get, we, we sow back to the Lord. We give it back to Him. And we trust that as we do that, that God's going to open up the windows of heaven and bless us. Uh, and so as always, there's three ways you can give. Uh, you can go to our website, encnj.org, and just hit the giving icon. 
uh, or you can go uh, to PushPay. Uh, it's a texting platform and you just text the letters ENCNJ to the number 77977. Unbelievably convenient way to do it. Or lastly, you can give uh, via uh, mail. You can just mail in your check or, or offering to 101 Gibraltar Drive right here in Morris Plains, New Jersey. Hey, every nation, God loves you and I think you're pretty amazing too. Have a great week. 